This week we visit Tel Aviv and sample Bauhaus architecture. Then to ancient Iran and Persepolis, the capital of ancient Persia. Then we take a two-step in the home of dance in London and finally to the mystical Stonehenge. In July 2005, the world-famous Disneyland in Orange County, California celebrated its 50th birthday. More than 100,000 people attended, a far cry from the scorching opening day half a century earlier. A day so hot, many a high-heeled shoe sank into the newly laid asphalt. This time, celebrities real and unreal were in attendance. Wow, look at all these people. This is incredible. I still can remember the first time I came here, when I came over here from Austria. And I especially remember the first time Maria and I brought our kids here to Disneyland. We all had an amazing time here as a family. And as a father, I love seeing my kids having so much fun. Soon after Disneyland's opening, Adventureland, Tomorrowland, Frontierland and Fantasyland became known to children around the world through Disney's use of the then infant medium of television. But few outside knew the huge financial and technical hurdles Disney had to overcome to realise his dream. Walt Disney was already a household name thanks to his animated creations including Mickey Mouse. Disney's idea in 1953 to turn 160 acres of Orange County farmland into a family attraction was a $17 million risk. And then, just as he did for the art of animation, Disney took the fairground concept to a whole new level. He built castles, dug rivers and moved his animated characters from celluloid to a three-dimensional world. I think the secret of Disneyland is it's never completed. It's uh, always inventing itself, reinventing itself, creating fantastic rides, redoing the area, creating a new park next door. Walt Disney's concept has now crossed the globe. There are Disney parks in Florida, Tokyo, Paris, and even communist China, with the latest opening in Hong Kong. In Japan, no childhood is complete without a visit to Tokyo Disneyland or Disney Sea. In 2003, the sprawling kingdom celebrated its 20th anniversary. As usual, Disney royalty, Mickey, Minnie and Donald Duck were there. Mickey and Minnie were a natural for Japan, especially among young Japanese women who are renowned for their love of anything kawaii or cute. This audience were adding to the previous 310 million people in Japan who had visited since 1983. Our audience here are basically local oriented. 90 plus percent of the people comes from within Japan. Therefore, our biggest challenge is to keep the park fresh. So every time they return to our park, we have something new, just like the event we have today. Theme parks are huge business these days. In the year preceding the 20th anniversary, 25 million people, or almost one-fifth of Japan's population, visited Tokyo Disneyland and the adjacent Tokyo Disney Sea. Walt Disney World in Florida and Disneyland in California continue to average more than 26 million visitors a year. Magic or not, the numbers are staggering. Disney is very special to each and every one of us, so being here on the 50th is even more special, exactly on the day. We were here on opening day 50 years ago, and so I'm here with my mom. Uh, I was only 18 months old at the time, so I don't really remember an awful lot about it, but I was in a really neat Davy Crockett outfit at the time. There's no doubt the magic and secret of Disney's financial success is the fascination it holds for children. Children of all ages. Thank you. Coming up, the Bauhaus architecture of Tel Aviv. Since the early 1920s, the name Bauhaus has been associated with the avant-garde. 
The Bauhaus architects have gone down in history as a German art movement that influenced the world. But it may surprise many that the best surviving example of Bauhaus architecture lives on in another country, Israel. In 2004, UNESCO added Tel Aviv to its list of World Heritage Sites because of its collection of Bauhaus architecture. In the white city of Tel Aviv, the type of originality of work that was done, the type of innovation that was done, and the committee agreed that this was an outstanding work that should be kept as a heritage for the entire world. Tel Aviv boasts some 4,000 Bauhaus structures, most of them residential buildings that have already been restored or will be soon. The UNESCO decision enshrined the spirit of Tel Aviv neighbourhoods, a marriage of engineering and art that produced functional buildings of clean geometry and undisguised structural elements like steel, glass and concrete. From the beginning, Tel Aviv, as opposed to Jerusalem, has been the city of entertainment. The city where all the newest things and the most modern things and the most current things come first of all to Tel Aviv. It is actually the connection between Israel and the outside world. UNESCO's recognition of White City confirmed what locals have known for decades. They live in a special place. But the unlikely road from Germany to Tel Aviv for the Bauhaus architects was, like many stories of the 1930s, steeped in pain. The Bauhaus school was closed by the Nazis in 1933 and facing persecution at home, 17 of its former students fled to British-administered Palestine. There, their ideas found fertile ground. The movement flourished from the 1930s to the 1950s. Actually, the absorption of the ideas of the modernist movement in Tel Aviv is a combination of a number of circumstances. First, virgin ground in a city that had just been established and was taking the first steps of its development, the beginning of the third Aliyah, the wave of immigration in the 1930s, which was a massive immigration that came with very broad financial means and the need to provide housing solutions to the new immigrants. Tel Aviv is the hub of Israel's high tech, high finance and high life. Recently, residents of Israel's wealthiest and most cosmopolitan city have discovered they live in an architectural treasure trove. It was established by Jewish immigrants who first lived in tents on sand dunes next to the Arab town of Jaffa. Tel Aviv was the first modern Jewish metropolis. It was founded at the turn of the century on the edge of the Mediterranean. The Bauhaus architects adapted their utopian European dreams to local conditions, designing economically constructed buildings penetrated by sunlight and air. German or French picture windows shrunk or stretched out to become narrow strip windows. Balconies were added and stilts lifted the buildings off the street to allow the flow of air. Slanted roofs gave way to roof gardens used for laundry and social events. The white and beige structures rising up from the heart of Tel Aviv soon earned it the nickname the White City. The Bauhaus aesthetic of unadorned functionalism Air, light and simple lines has remained modern. The melding of the fine and the applied arts has left Tel Aviv exactly how the Bauhaus architects intended, as a nice place to live. Unlike natural wonders of the world, many man-made landmarks from the past come down to us in fragments. Such is the case with Persepolis, capital of ancient Persia, a pre-Christian rival with Athens for the title of crowning achievement in ancient civilization. Sacked and burned by Alexander the Great in 330 BC and then ravished by time, it has taken the dedicated work of successive generations of archaeologists to reconstruct the once mighty city. Founded by Darius the Great around 518 BC, 
The massive wealth of his empire was evident in all aspects of its construction. Persepolis lies about 850 kilometers south of the present Iranian capital city of Tehran. It was an architectural marvel which took over a century to complete. By far the largest and most magnificent building is the Apadana, seen here in a British Museum animation. It was used mainly for great receptions by the kings. Its 72 columns stand on the enormous platform to which two monumental stairways on the north and on the east give access. They were adorned with rows of beautifully executed reliefs. Those reliefs remain at the site, but they and other Persepolis treasures can also be seen at a new British Museum gallery. What we've done really in this display is try and integrate these objects into a display that's much more transparent and open. This is one of the reliefs. On both sides there is a powerful figure, a carving of a lion biting the hindquarters of a bull. And you can see on either side monumental uh, late 19th century plaster casts or copies of uh, original reliefs that are still at the um, palace site of Persepolis in Iran. Darius lived long enough to see only a small part of his plans executed. It was left to his son and successor, Xerxes, to execute his brilliant and grandiose ideas. But its sacking by Alexander and his army was brutal and thorough. According to the Greek scholar Plutarch, its treasures were carried away on 20,000 mules and 5,000 camels. From the time of its barbaric destruction, until 1620 AD, when the site was first identified, Persepolis lay buried under its own ruins. Their ruins were not excavated until the 1930s, when the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago sponsored an archaeological expedition to Persepolis and its surrounds. Unfortunately, Alexander and his army did a very thorough job of looting and burning Persepolis. What the Oriental Institute recovered were objects either overlooked or dropped accidentally by the Macedonians. But there was enough to reveal a rich and sophisticated dynasty. A prized possession of the museum is the Cyrus Cylinder from King Cyrus the Great, who reigned between 550 and 530 BC. The inscriptions record the rebuilding of temples in foreign lands and the return of deported people. And another priceless possession of the museum is this, the Oxus treasure of gold and silver items made between the 4th and 5th centuries BC. So it's a collection of uh, gold bracelets, uh, gold appliques originally sewn onto clothing and belts and so on, um, and some coins originally, um, some um, luxurious tablewares, uh, and um, a rather stunning um, object is a little gold chariot model um, which was perhaps intended for some rich boy out on the eastern edge of the Persian Empire. The sacking of the Baghdad Museum during the current Iraq war damaged many antiquities from Persia. The incident was a reminder of how fragile our link with the past can be and how quickly even the mightiest empire can disappear. Coming up, London's home of contemporary dance, La Band. A feature of many man-made landmarks, ancient and modern, is that they were central gathering places for the society they were created in. They were sometimes places of gruesome entertainment, but more usually important religious or ceremonial sites. This is a story that blends an old story, art and architecture. The Laban Centre in South East London is home to the world's largest building for contemporary dance. The building is cutting edge in design and purpose built for its occupants. The challenge was to do a building in a kind of a rundown area and to make a building which is like a jewel, like a gem, which would attract people. 
and make this, help make this place um, attractive and an important part for London in the future. The Le Bain Centre is a classic example of how the physical environment can impact upon the purpose for which it was built, in this case, contemporary dance. Because to see the students being stimulated by a beautiful building like this is wonderful. And of course we recognise that we're adding to the architecture by the dance we're doing within it. It was designed for dance, it's not a converted building. And so many dance centres are conversions of old buildings, like our old one was. So we're very thrilled about it. The complex includes 13 dance studios and a 300-seat theatre. It has a gymnasium and warm-up areas. There is a library, and on the main concourse, murals adorn the walls. The studios are spacious and the flooring. It just allows you to elongate the movement more, to feel the body more, feel the connections. You just want to fly. Outside, the centre has a translucent cladding and walls which act like a mirror to the naked eye. The Swiss architects behind the design say it was important to blend the building into its urban setting. We conceive the building like a little city, like a compressed city, with streets, ramps, plazas, courtyards, uh, light coming in from different sides, daylight, artificial light melting together. So that was like the metaphor we used for the building, based on the kind of um, idea of the client as being such a diverse group of people. From the States you don't really get too much internationally, so that was my purpose to come over here and get a feeling for Europe and the dance scene. So this is a great place to do it because there's so many different people from all over, students, choreographers, teachers from all over the place. So it's great, it's a good place to collect it. Under the watchful eye of director David Waring, 11 members of the Transition Dance Company are being put through their paces. I think the space offers them a chance to really fulfil the movement that they might be trying to explore at any particular moment. Um, I think the amount of activity that's going on means that there's always some um, level of vitality and um, and a definite kind of intellectual stimulation going on which keeps feeding back into the physical work as well. The 11 members have been handpicked for the postgraduate course. They're trained by five top choreographers and tour the world as a first step before starting their dancing careers. For teachers and pupils, the Laban Centre is a great place to learn their craft. And while times and styles may have changed, the relationship between architecture and creative expression perhaps remains as strong as ever. Both can be an expression of praise and celebration. The sun is revealed from behind the scudding clouds and bathes the lichen-covered stones. They were dragged here from the mountains of Wales and the marks of the ancient stone cutters are clearly seen, especially on some that have fallen to a new position. This is Stonehenge, one of the most recognisable sites of the ancient world. The mysterious megalithic ruin stands on open downland of Salisbury Plain in southern England. The legends surrounding the huge rocks go back to the time of King Arthur and Merlin the Wizard. Stonehenge retains a powerful physical presence. In recent years, more than 20,000 neo-pagans gather at the site in mid-June for the summer solstice, the Northern Hemisphere's longest day of the year. The day was of special significance in ancient cultures, as evidenced by the number of monuments, including Stonehenge, which follow the path of the sun. The reason Stonehenge is so special is that obviously it is an ancient monument. It's been in existence for over 5,000 years. And the alignment of the stone circle um, it means that when the sun rises, you can actually see the sun rise along the, the, the line of the ancient processional way, along the, the avenue, and over the hillstone. It is a very special place to be um, on this, what is the, the longest day of the year. The solstice at Stonehenge is not just for druids and spiritualists. 
the dawn celebration has the feel of a pop concert. The, the numbers have been very much the same as last year. We're talking between 20 and 21,000, and the crowd has been as it has been over the last few years. Great mood, everyone just wants to come along and enjoy the solstice and enjoy it in a way uh, that, that, that everyone can get involved and, and, and rather than having any trouble, which we haven't seen for a good number of years. The solstice allows the public a rare opportunity to walk among the 20 ton stones and touch them. While the prehistoric stone monument is open to the public throughout the year, there are a number of restrictions as the site struggles with ever-increasing tourist numbers. The World Heritage Site attracts nearly a million tourists a year. Facilities to cope with the volume have recently undergone a major upgrade with the installation of a tunnel. Really we want to ensure that the landscape in its entirety is protected and that means the stones but also the barrows and the archaeological remains and the whole setting of Stonehenge, that's extremely important. Some say the giant stones at Stonehenge were originally brought from Africa to Ireland by giants. Others say the stones were used as a site for performing rituals and for healing. Scholars estimate the circle was built between 3000 BC and 1600 BC, but there is no consensus on whether it was a temple, a burial ground, an astronomy site, or served other spiritual or temporal purposes. While Stonehenge has always retained a strong attraction, British interest in the site was given an added impetus in August 1906. It was used as a subject for Britain's first aerial photograph. From that moment, humanity was given a new perspective of the planet. It's the landscape around Stonehenge. It's made us understand that Stonehenge wasn't just standing alone. It's part of a much bigger landscape. So you have the burials all around, on the hills all around. You have other ritual sites, sort of, you could say temples, uh, nearby of similar dates, some of earlier dates. So we can understand the whole development of the landscape over several thousand years. The taking of the photograph was worthy of celebration 100 years later. The original revealed previously unseen structures. Perhaps one of the, the earliest discoveries local to here was Woodhenge, which was discovered on aerial photographs as a crop mark um, and is now displayed um, as, as something that pu the public can go and see. Um, but it's really it's at the same date as Stonehenge, but because it was wood, it had totally vanished from the landscape. While the modern world has been able to preserve the monument for future generations, there remain many mysteries surrounding Stonehenge which may never be solved.